Hi, I'm Azim Latif from Montefiore Medical Center in New York, and I'm delighted to talk to you at this Meet the Experts sessions at TCT 2021 in Orlando. I wanted to share some of my clinical experience with you from some of the complex cases we've been using Shockwave for since it's been approved. Uh, so these are more real world cases, not the kind of cases that would have been included in the clinical study, but I think they show the potential for this technology in calcified lesions and particularly to simplify our procedures and make them safer. So let's look at the first case. Um, this is a 63 year old patient <clears throat> with the typical risk factors for coronary disease came in very symptomatic, a lot of angina. Uh, I remember this case really well because he actually is the fa father in law of a friend of mine, so I had to make sure he had a great result. Um, and so you see that the RCA has lots of long diffuse calcific disease from the proximal segment all the way distally, just till before the cracks. Clearly, we're going to need some sort of um, lesion preparation here, um, and it's unlikely that just balloons are going to be enough. I was a little bit concerned about using rotoblader in a case like this because of such diffuse disease with these multiple bends and what the risk of no reflow, dissection or perforation would be. So we started out first seeing, you know, what, you know, what, what could we do this with shockwave, but realizing up front that potentially we couldn't use shockwave here from the beginning. We'd need to create some space to get the shockwave balloon down. And Honestly, I don't see that as a failure of shockwave. I think when you're dealing with very complex lesions, we sometimes have to use multiple modalities to facilitate getting good lesion preparation. So yeah, we decided from the beginning we would need to do some pre-dilatation. It was also obvious when we tried to pass an imaging catheter and nothing really would pass. So we pre-dilated, as you see, with a 2-0 balloon, um, trying to really just create a little bit of space, not creating barotrauma, but creating some space to get the shockwave balloon down. This is what the result looked like after the 2-0 balloon. Um, really effective uh, multiple pre-dilatations, but we still really couldn't get, <clears throat> we couldn't get the OCT catheter to go down still. And I think just because there's such severe calcific disease here. So we decided at that stage, uh, we would need to do, we would go with the shockwave and clearly we wouldn't be able to get it all the way down distally to the cracks without some sort of support. So we had a supportive wire and on top of that we did use a guideliner to really be able to deliver the shockwave distally. And so here you see on the pictures on the right, we started shockwaving from really very distal, close to the cracks, uh, with our first shockwave using a 2.5 balloon. You can see the guideliner in picture number two, uh, further back, which allowed the delivery. And so shockwave that entire area and really just went very slowly. So, you know, did one or two, set, you know, one or two sort of sessions of 10 impulses, moved it very slightly back and kept moving up the artery, knowing we're going to be treating the entire artery. So you see with the 2.5, we came back to the mid vessel, but clearly we, we still needed more. This is the result after the shock wave. We did an angio just also to show that you know, we don't have any massive dissections here. There's no perforation, there's Timmy 3 flow. So even in treating this very complex case, we have safety uh, as we do this. So then did additional shockwaves. We took a bigger balloon for the more proximal vessel. Uh, we now have a 3-0 balloon. Uh, another technique that's sometimes useful if you're struggling to deliver a shockwave is to use a buddy wire. So in this more proximal segment, you can see we have two wires, and so we just used a buddy wire there to get the balloon into the proximal segment. And again, because we had such bad diffuse disease, we just decided to use all the impulses um, on the balloon to treat this entire area. So this is after the second shock wave. We've now really treated this entire artery. Um, the artery looks significantly better. There's still Timmy 3 flow. There's no massive dissections, and now we can clearly see our target zone for where we want to stand. Um, we, after that, went a little bit more pre-dilatation with a non-compliant balloon and then pull, put multiple overlapping stents uh, from distal to proximal, which we then post-dilated. This is what the result looks like, which I think is really a phenomenal result in this kind of really complex anatomy, uh, certainly because, you know, well, this was done without rotational atherectomy, um, and you see really fantastic stent expansion. I also have some imaging to show you because I think in these complex lesions, it's not good enough just an angiographic view, but here you see the OCT we did in this and really 
fantastic stent expansion. Uh, there was one area we thought we could expand even slightly better, so we did some additional post dilatation, but really our minimal stent area was 7.84 for a segment treated with the 3.0 DES. Uh, so really great expansion. Um, and here just showing you the final end geography with Timmy 3 flow. So this is the first case I wanted to show you, uh, which I think certainly wouldn't be included in any sort of clinical study. I don't know how you would randomize a patient like that to a clinical study. Uh, it's a patient who clearly you know, very diffuse disease, very complex. I wanted to show you another case. This is a more recent case. And part of why I like this case is when I showed this case to all my partners, uh, this is soon after we had Shockwave um, introduced commercially into our lab. Every single person in the room said to me, there's no way shockwave is going to work in this case. You have to do atherectomy, and the only thing that's going to work in this patient is atherectomy. So I thought it was a great case to show. Uh, this is a 74-year-old patient, also very sick, previous PCI on the LED and RCA, presents to an outside hospital with an end STEMI. He now has a left heart cath, which I'll show you, which shows um, calcified nodule in the left main to proximal LED, and he was actually transferred to us for a cabbage evaluation. Our surgeons took one look at him and said he's not a great candidate because of age and his comorbidities. And so we brought him to the cath lab. And let me show you his first picture. So I think you see the stent on the proximal LED. Let's just see if this will play better for you. There's this huge calcified nodule here in the proximal LED, which I think you'll see on the imaging. You see it here, there's this huge protruding nodule, really protruding into the left main on the LED. And so, like I said, when my partner saw this, everybody was a game. Come on, you know, you've got to do, you've got to do atherectomy. That's the only thing that works in nodular calcium. So, you know, not wanting to argue with them. I actually tried atherectomy. Uh, I tried a 1.5 burr. It just flew by. Uh, it didn't do anything because it all, you know, where the atherectomy works as well depends on the wire bias, right? And so, yeah, the wire bias actually took the burr away from the calcified nodule and not towards it. So after atherectomy and even a balloon, you really see the nodule hasn't changed at all. So that's when I got to have my way and said, you know, let's try a shockwave balloon. We went with a 4.0 shockwave balloon. You can notice in the first image on the left how there's still an indentation on the balloon. And when I see these nodular cases, my approach to it is really to use as many impulses as I can on that nodule to really try and impact it in some way. So I use the entire 80 impulses right there in that segment. Um, patient remained really stable uh, throughout this um, with no hemodynamic compromise. Uh, we then, after that, I did a Wolverine and a non compliant balloon and then went with a 3 5 by 26 stent, which I then did a pot and post dilated it with up to 4.5 millimeters proximally. And I'll just show you, hopefully, the final result. Um, let's go back. Here we go. And here's the final result. You see like really amazing stent expansion, but really it's the IVUS image that really is, is, says a lot about how we treat this lesion. You see great stent expansion, but look at this nodule, it's really pushed to the side. We've got an amazing stent expansion, a great result, done safely uh, in a really short time. Uh, this was a procedure done via the radial artery. So, you know, um, patient goes home the next day with a great result and minimal complications. So I think the two cases together really demonstrate some of the advantages of using shockwave and calcified lesions. Thank you. So, you know, good question about um, how you use shockwave is what your algorithm is and when, when do I personally use shockwave in my practice. So we are, uh, at Monty, we are very imaging heavy practice. So we now do intracoronary imaging in about 80% of our cases. And so we'll often make the decision based on the baseline imaging. So if we see, particularly in larger vessels, areas of severe calcification, at least 270 degrees or more, uh, and we think we can get a balloon down, we don't need atherectomy up front to be able to get space, we'll use shockwave up front as our initial strategy. We've, in, certainly in our practice, we've moved a lot away from using uh, orbital atherectomy to rather using shockwave and from using cutting balloons very often to using shockwave uh, up front as our initial uh, strategy to modify calcium. 
it hasn't replaced as a rotational atherectomy because there are a lot of lesions where you just can't get anything down, where a catheter, an IVUS catheter, an OCT catheter won't pass. And in those cases, you know, rotational atherectomy is extremely useful uh, to treat those lesions. So we don't see these sort of modalities as mutually exclusive. And, you know, you need to have both in the lab. Sometimes you actually have to have, you know, both in the same patient as well. So if I think about you know, my best practices about using IVL and, and where <clears throat> I've truly gotten the advantages are, I think there are a couple of things. I think the one is lesion patient selection, right? So you know, if you use it in lesions with a lot of calcium where you can actually deliver the balloon, I think you get great outcomes. I think the second thing we've kind of realized is that there are times when you should just pre-dilate to get the balloon down. And I don't see that pre-dilating with a 2.0 or 2.5 balloon so I can get a 3.5 or 4.0 shockwave. I don't see that as a limitation of the technology. I think it just facilitates a quicker, easier procedure. So we do that very often. I think the other part that we do is we use imaging then after we've used the shockwave and prepared the lesion before implanting our stents to really make sure we've gotten great lesion preparation. Um, and then also I think, you know, my strategy changes when I'm treating, say, a napkin ring calcification versus very eccentric or nodular calcification. When you treat napkin ring calcification, I mean, I did one this week where after 20 impulses, I was done. I hit it with 20 impulses, I saw the balloon pop, my stent went in and I was done. Uh, when you have more nodular calcification, I tend to stay there longer, use more impulses to treat it. And even if I don't see something on OCT uh, or imaging, doesn't mean you haven't treated the lesion. So the other part, I, the other, I think, important um, tip I have is that if you're using, treating these eccentric cases, nodular cases, after you've done shockwave, go with a non-compliant balloon. Really go with a non-compliant balloon at high pressure. Make sure you've really prepared that lesion before putting your stent in. If I think about how the calcium marker is going to progress, I mean, I think one of the things, unfortunately, I still see in my practice right now, uh, whether you know, mostly often referred patients to me for um, for treatment, are we still seeing a lot of patients with underexpanded stents? We're still seeing, you know, the kind of patients if I think that I treat right now, particularly where I work in the Bronx in the United States, uh, where I have a large community of patients with a lot of risk factors, advanced age and a lot of calcified lesions, the whole spectrum's changed. I'm doing atherectomy and shockwave on an almost daily basis now um, because those are the kind of patients I see. So, you know, those patients are not going away. And if we really want to get great outcomes in our patients and make sure they're not coming back with restenosis, it all starts with great lesion preparation. So I can only see that as we move forward, we're going to be using more of these modalities because the kind of patients we see are patients with more severe calcium, more severe disease. If I think about a sort of research point of view, some of the areas that I think we need to work on and understand better, um, one of the important areas I think is bifurcations. I think we can do a much better job with bifurcations, particularly with good lesion preparation. So I'm hoping to see, you know, in the future more clinical studies on how to manage calcified bifurcations and calcium around the bifurcation, about bifurcations. And probably the, the last group that I still struggle with where I think we need more clinical data and we need, uh, and I think IVL could be a, a important adjunct is in restenosis and particularly patients with underexpanded stents with calcified either neoatherosclerosis or lesions that were not adequately pre-treated in the beginning. I think that's an area where we're gonna see more work and more research.